pray. We want to continue that look, that adoration of our Savior and our God. He is he's everything. He gives us life and breath and all things. In him we live and move and have our being. And so we want to continue that adoration as we look at his word this morning and see all the things that he has provided for us and the the call that he has placed upon us. Let's pray together. Father, you are good. You are great. Your provision is abundant. Your kindness is astounding to us. We pray as we look at your word that we would continue to be impressed by you and also have a desire within ourselves to express how great you are, not only in this building, but in our home and in our workplace, to our neighbors and wherever we go. We have, we have much to boast in, not of ourselves, but in you. And so we pray that our boast uh, would travel for your glory and for the good of our neighbors. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So corporations generally have mission statements to help define what they're trying to accomplish. And I was looking up some popular mission statements to give you a little sampling. And uh, I was questioning the selection of this one as the sixth best mission statement. It comes from Envision app. This is on the screen there for you. This is their mission statement. Question assumptions. Think deeply. Iterate as a lifestyle. Details, details. Design is everywhere. Integrity. So I, I guess um, they were coming up with this and they were like, guys, we forgot to include integrity. So slap it on there at the end. So I'm thinking, way to focus while you're expressing your mission. Um, I'm sure it's awesome. It probably is an amazing company, I guess. Um, this one makes sense. Uh, number seven in their list was Honest Tea, to create and promote great tasting, healthy, organic beverages. Now that's like simple and to the point, right? Like, I get it. Whether it's true or not is another matter, but like that's pretty basic. Um, this one sounds really noble. Number three. Patagonia, I don't know if I'm even saying it right, but we're in business to save our home planet. Doesn't that sound really noble? I'm not sure how they're going to accomplish that, but that's their goal. They might also want to make some money. <laughs> Possibly. They might, maybe. Um, number two, sweet green. I like this one. To inspire healthier communities by connecting people to real food as opposed to hot dogs. And number one on their list of great mission statements is life is good. It's to spread the power of optimism. <laughs> uh, it's interesting. You've seen it. Life is good. You see those things on the back of Jeep wheels and everything. Life is good. You see it on T-shirts, mugs, everything. So, yeah, life is pretty good when, uh, when the Lord gives you grace. Uh, we have a lot to rejoice in. Well, the... One of several versions of our church's mission statements reads this way. The mission of Cornerstone Church shall be the edification, that means to build up, and equipping of the saints for the promotion of evangelistic and missionary work through the public worship of God and sound proclamation of his word. It's like a mouthful. There's a lot to it, trying to get across this main em uh, emphasis. We gather together to worship God in order to be encouraged and built up and ready to advance the gospel. We worship to be refreshed in our soul, encouraged in our spirit, equipped not only to be confident in the gospel ourselves and with our family, but to bring that gospel message to a world around us. Worshiping God and proclaiming his amazing love and grace is the greatest mission in the world. 
worshiping God and proclaiming his amazing love and grace is the greatest mission in the world. We're going to look at Romans 15. We're going to start in verse 20. Our scripture reading earlier started in verse 22 intentionally, but we're going to reach back into verse 20 just to get the flow. Paul was telling them, I, I, I've been doing this ministry. I've been performing this ministry of the gospel. My mission philosophy in verse 20 says, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints from Macedonia and Achaia, have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed, they owed it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So Paul exemplifies in this passage a desire to advance the gospel, and as he desires that advance of the gospel, I, I believe it, it should mark our lives, a desire for the gospel to be proclaimed here and out of here outside the walls of the church, into our homes, into our workplace, throughout our neighborhood, wherever we are, it should be our desire to see that taking place. And then even beyond that, the places that we can't gather, places we, we can't go, there are others who are going and bringing the gospel. And it should be our desire to be investing in in those, those gospel advances as well. So as we look through the text this morning, we'll see three different concepts about investing in the advance of the gospel. The first concept that we'll think about for a couple of moments is investing in the advance of the gospel. This is for all of us. This is for all of us. It's not just for the hired few. It's for every believer that has come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. God has invested life in us. He's, he's entrusted us. He's placed a deposit within us. That deposit is the gospel of Jesus Christ and Christ himself living in us and living through us. When Jesus was finished with his earthly ministry and had been uh, seen after his resurrection, he gave this commission to his disciples. We're familiar with it. We call it the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, the Bible says this, Go therefore and make disciples of whom? All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age or to the end of the world. Wherever you go, for as long as you go, I go with you. Now what's interesting is in verse 18, what makes it really amazing is that Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Based upon that entrustment of that authority in me, I send you with my authority to the nations to bring the gospel. We're not proclaiming ourselves, we're not proclaiming our church, and we're not proclaiming our brand of Christianity. We are proclaiming Christ. It's about Jesus Christ and him crucified. The, the Bible gives us so many passages of Scripture that flood into our minds when we think of the, the content and the motivation for bringing the gospel to the nations. Remember when Jesus had fed the 5,000 in John's accounting? Jesus told them, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And like people started t taking off, right? Like, you're, that's weird. That's this is just like too much for me. I got to go. And he looked at his disciples and he said, are you going to leave too? He said, where, they said, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. And these words of eternal life invested in Christ and coming from Christ are what are, have been invested into us to dispense to a people, ourselves included. Words of life. Where else are we going to go and hear the words of life but people that gather in the name of Jesus Christ looking at what God has to say and we leave from this place with those words of life to bring to the nations. God has given us this entrustment. He provides eternal life. This is why Paul said at the end of Colossians 1, he says, Him we proclaim, Christ we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. What are we proclaiming about him? This is a great question. We've all been invested in the advance of the gospel. God has called us to be invested in the advance of the gospel. What are we, what are we going with? Well, we're telling people that Jesus is Lord, right? That Jesus is Savior. That Jesus provides forgiveness of sin. That Jesus provides real, enduring eternal life. See, so much of the church world wants to tell you, tell me what God needs. God needs you to do X. God needs you to do Y. God needs you to do Z. We proclaim a God who loves and provides not a God who is needy. That's what Paul proclaimed at Athens one day. He was walking. His, he was going to meet some people. He looks around. He sees all these people dedicated to all kinds of religious endeavors, including the shrine to an unknown God. And he says, I want to, I want to tell you about this unknown God. He doesn't need you to build him anything. He doesn't need anything. He's not needy. He's a provider. And what will he provide? Life. Abundant, enduring life. Life that will span across your death. Life that will outlast your 70 to 80 to 90 years on this earth? We know it always comes to an end. You might be one of those people that eats that really real food that that company wants to offer you. Real food. You're going to connect real people with real food. Eat all the real food, and get all the real exercise, you're still going to die. Happy day. God provides real life that can never be taken away, even if you eat Doritos. You have been entrusted with that gospel. We have that gospel in earthen vessels, but the glory is not of us. The glory is of him. So our pointing is always away from us and toward him. This is the gospel message. 
as we look a little further into our text, there are numerous ways of investing in the advance of the gospel. This is our second concept that we want to talk about. There are numerous ways of investing in the advance of the gospel. So we proclaim the gospel to people, right? And we demonstrate by God's grace the gospel in our lives. That's very helpful. But this passage talks about another way of investing in the gospel, and that is by helping with physical, material needs of those going with the gospel. Take a look at verse 24. Verse 24. He says, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you. That's a very important expression. That is... If you don't recognize the code word of the day, that's, I'm going to come and visit you on my way to Spain. I am doing my pre-field ministry. Have you heard of pre-field ministry? Used to be called uh, deputation, right? I'm going to go around from church to church, and I'm going to collect some support so I can go and minister the gospel on the other side of the world. So that's essentially what what Paul is saying. I'm going to come and visit you, Jerome. I have, I have for many years longed to see you. I've got to go where Christ has not yet been preached. It's obvious that preaching has happened there, and I just proclaimed to you a whole gospel filled, a whole letter filled with the gospel. Christ has been preached among you. I'm going to come and visit you and head to Spain so that I can, from there, um, fr- from you on the way, receive some support. The, the word there is propempto. In the Greek, this is a great, great word. My Greek teacher taught me how to remember pemto. We were all teenagers at the time. Pemto means to send out. So he said, you know those things on your face? (laughs) Isn't that, it's like a really vivid way to remember pemto. Send it out, send it out. Well, pro pemto is send out for or send out with. In fact, the word is used in two other places in the New Testament that make it very clear the concept of providing for the journey uh, with this concept. In, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul wrote to Titus, do your best to speed Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their way. Speed, that's our word, propemto. See that they lack nothing. In other words, don't just send them on their way, send them with something. What does it mean to send them with something? Provision for the journey. They've got to eat. They've got to sleep. They've got to get there. They need provision for the journey. So when Zenus heads out and when Apollos heads out, send them with something. Physical, material help. John the Apostle said the same thing in 2 John, or should be 3 John, verse 6, where it says, He testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of the gospel. Send them. In other words, commission them, send them with something. Help them. So this is what Paul is asking. He says, I'm coming. My mission is to preach and proclaim the name of Christ to people that have not heard Christ. They would, with their mouths, proclaim Christ. I want to go with the gospel so that unbelievers will come to saving faith in Christ. This is my mission. I long for, for many years to come to you, but I have been hindered because I have this mission, and I'm, I'm dedicated to this mission of preaching where Christ has not yet been named, and I'm going to go to Spain, but I'm going to stop and say hello for a little while, But when I stop there, I need your support to send me on my journey with provision. This is the concept. And then he gives a little update on his mission, what he's doing currently. And that is, before I come to you, I have to make a stop in Jerusalem. And part of that stop in Jerusalem is to make provision, like I'm asking for provision from you, I'm making provision for the people in Jerusalem that came from other believers in Uh, Archaea and Macedonia. I'm going to bring a gift from them. Take a look at verses 25 and following. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid 
to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, for they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owed it to them. For if the Gentiles come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered to them what is collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. So this section is recounting Paul's plan. Uh, Before arriving in Rome, he is fulfilling the ministry that he has to the Gentiles. He's sending support from those Gentile churches to Jerusalem. Paul considered this part of his gospel ministry. Considered this part of his gospel ministry to provide support for those that were in need. Isn't that interesting? Our mission comes with all manner of helpful provisions. The uh, Grace Dental Medical Mission used to, used to make the statement kind of just to capture it. It's hard for someone to hear the gospel if they have a hurting tooth. So the, the Grace Dental, Medi- uh, Dental Medical Mission would go and fix their teeth so they weren't in pain, so they would have an easy hearing of the gospel. See, it's just things that attend the gospel ministry or things that are helpful to people. And so we find creative ways to try to do that. He talks about bringing aid as uh, is our word for deacon, diaconia. He talks about making a contribution in verse 26. That's the word for fellowship, koinonia. We're going to make some kind of a contribution. He uses the word koinonia again, or koinoneo, in verse 27. If, if, if they've come to share in your spiritual things, then we should also share in the physical things. And then he says, indeed, they owe it to them. So there's, there's this concept of caring for people's needs in the middle of bringing the gospel. Can you see that in the text? I think, I think it's pretty fair to say as we invest in the advance of the gospel, it can, you know, there are different ways that we can invest ourselves in it. There's, there's the proclamation and living of the gospel, and then there's the providing for those that are bringing the gospel. This passage indicates that they were pleased to do this. They were happy to do it. In fact, if you look in the parallel passages in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, it talks about how they were like exceedingly happy to sacrificially give out of their poverty. See, it's, it's one of those things that, um, that blows your mind. That's like grace does amazing, th- God's grace does amazing things. People that are in deep poverty themselves dug down deep to provide for those that were in deeper poverty. That's what 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 gives indication of. It's, it's very interesting. What was the motivation for it? Those are my brothers and sisters in Christ, and they're in need. And the gospel, the gospel is way more important than any financial, material matter that I have. So not only can we tell the gospel, live the gospel, help those uh, financially in, in bringing the gospel, there's another way that this passage tells us we can invest in the gospel, and that is through prayer. We can invest by regularly praying for the advance of the gospel. Look down at verses 30 through 32. This is, he, he's calling for the people to, to pray for the mission, the expansion of the gospel. Verse 30, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. So Paul appeals for participation in prayer ministry by calling attention to their Savior, I appeal to you in Christ. I appeal to you for all you've learned and received in Christ. And I appeal to you when you think of Jesus Christ, the kind of Savior he is, and the kindness and meekness and gentleness that he has displayed. Pray, 
Pray with me. Strive in prayer with me. Remember Christ who strove in the garden in prayer. So much so that he was sweating as if great drops of blood. Lord, help people come to know Christ. Help people to see him. To understand him. To understand that he's real and that he's good and that he provides real life. Lord, help them to call upon his name and be saved. This is how he appeals to them. Strive with me together in prayer that people would come to know Christ as Savior. Look at him. And also he appeals by the love that comes from the Spirit. God's Spirit has invested himself in you. God shed his love abroad in your heart through his Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love and joy and peace. So he appeals to them. God has placed his Spirit in you. Love with me. Love with me. That people that are in desperate need, that don't know Christ, they're in darkness, they're blind, they're dead. They need life. Invest yourself. Strive with me in prayer. Labor in this. Three requests he makes of them. Pray, first of all, that I'll be delivered from unreasonable men that would hinder the advance of the gospel. You see that? Unreasonable men. Uh, did God answer that prayer? Well, read the book of Acts, and you'll see he didn't die in the process from when he was asking for prayer and when um, he, the letter of Acts ends or the book of Acts ends. So God answered it, but not without challenge because remember he was taken in chains and had he not appealed to Caesar, it's possible his life would have been taken. A Caesar, where was he going to go for that? Any thoughts? Rome. <laughs> Where is he asking them to pray he would make it to? Rome. Oh. So yes, God answered the prayer, but it was not in comfort and lavish lifestyle. He was in a lot of difficulty through those times. Second prayer request he had for them was that the Jews would have freedom to receive the material gifts from the Gentiles. In other words, you think about the conflicts that would arise. Remember the, the temple and the tabernacle? Remember there was like the inner court where the male Jews could go? And then there was like the next layer out where some of the female Jews could go? And then there was another layer out where the Gentiles could hang out? Might there have arisen any animosity between Jews and Gentiles? You know that there is, and you know that there's a constant challenge that Christ has torn down those walls However, <laughs> those tensions remained in some ways. And so Paul says, pray that when this gift comes from Gentile believers to these Jewish believers, that they would not feel compelled to say, no, thank you, but instead would re graciously receive. And you can see in the book of Acts in chapter 21 and 24 that they did, in fact, receive that, that gift graciously. That's good. So God answered that prayer, too. And then there's a third area that he asks them for prayer about, is that he would arrive in Rome with joy for refreshment. He would arrive in Rome with joy for refreshment. You see that in verse 32. So that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Well, what do you think? The Bible doesn't answer necessarily. We know he arrived there. How happy was he? He had to go through shipwreck before he got there. Make sure you grab onto something. <laughs> Throw everything off overboard. Hold onto a plank. But God's not going to take any of our lives. It probably wasn't a very fun journey. But he arrived. The mission. The mission was continuing. However, he was in bonds. Under house arrest. And you know what the Lord did? The Lord saved prison guards. And when Paul wrote the book of Philippians, 
oozing with joy, where he said, I rejoice in my suffering on your behalf. Why? Why was he joyful? The mission continues. And while it might be costly, there might be difficulty along the way, I am not here to enjoy a steak. Maybe I am. Maybe I want a steak. But is my joy contingent upon a steak? Or is there another way that God satisfies us without the meat? I think there's another way. And you see it in the life of Jesus, right? My meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And so Paul arrived there. I would say he arrived with joy. And certainly the, what we'll see in just a moment here is that God refreshes us together when we participate together. So that leads us to our third concept of this morning. And that is this, investing in the advance of the gospel produces benefits. It's not benefits that we manufacture. It's not like, okay, I'll do this and then uh, and I'll provide you with some benefit. It's, 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 it's a lot more indirect than that, right? We invest in the gospel and the Lord is the one that produces benefits. And that, that's one of the things that we want to see here for a couple of moments He's calling them to be a partakers in the gospel by sharing, right, and then by praying. But listen to the words that he uses in this passage. In verse 22, this is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now since I no longer have any room in uh, room for work in these regions, since I have, will you read the next word with me? I have longed for many years to come to you. Look down at verse 32 again. So that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed by your company. There's a number of benefits I want for us to think about. And I'll try to do this briefly. The first result or benefit of advancing the gospel is that God will save some. God will save some. Now this text doesn't say that. But God's word does. Hold your hand here and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 just for a moment. We're going to come right back to Romans. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. It's a very encouraging passage in my mind. It's very encouraging to me. Where Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 right at the end of the chapter about the proclamation of the gospel and its results. Look at starting in verse 14. Second Corinthians 2 Corinthians 2.14. God's word says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. And to the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Listen to what he's saying. God is always leading us in a, a winning march, a triumphal procession. And the concept uh, that may be in mind is back in the days where the, uh, the armies would go off to battle and they would win a war, there would be those that would were prisoners of war that were coming back to the homeland for execution. And they're, they're coming back, they, the, the, the war is over, they're marching in, and the people are lying in the streets, and there's kind of like a parade of some sort, and they've got the, their incense to the gods going on, and so the soldiers are coming back, and this is a smell of what? Victory. There's a party. We're, we've won. But there are some others among that group. They're smelling those same smells, but it doesn't smell like victory. It smells like death. 
kind of morbid, that part of it. But if you think about this, as we go forth with the gospel, God utilizes it to let people know they're alive in Him or they're dead apart from Him. They're alive in Him or they're dead apart from Him. This is what the Gospel does. And God has promised to save some. And so this is a benefit of investing in the Gospel ministry because God will save some. And that's what He said back in Romans 15 in verse uh, 21. I'm going to head back there. There's a second result of investing that I think is encouraging and that is that God will be magnified. God will be magnified. If you think about Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul said this as he was in that house arrest situation in Rome. He said, it is my eager expectation and my hope that I will not be ashamed at all but that with full courage, now, as always, Christ will be, see that word, honored? It's a great word. It's the word megaluno, which means to magnify. Christ will be magnified or enlarged in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, Christ will be magnified as I serve him, as I give people the gospel. Investing in the gospel has the, the benefit of people coming to Christ and the benefit of Christ being magnified. Now, is Christ ever made better by anything we do? No, he's already perfect. What we're doing is we're taking a, a microscope and letting people in to the... Is it microscope? No, other thing. Help me. Telescope. Thank you. Telescope. Looking out there, huge. And, and he comes into focus. Magnified. That's what he does. That's what God does through the preaching of the gospel. There's a third result that will benefit, and that is that God will provide refreshment. In verse 23, we already mentioned, he longed for many years to come. In verse 24, he speaks about enjoying their company for a while. And in verse 32, he says, when I come, I want to come with joy and I want to be refreshed in your company. Now, this is very interesting, the way he, the word he chooses here. The word refreshment is the most intimate of terms. He's talking actually about like the, the intertwining of life in its most intimate ways. Um, used in other places about the love of a husband and wife together. This is the type of love, the refreshment, the, the satisfaction is the concept of soul that Paul speaks about having as he's with people that are joined, joined to the yoke of Christ with him. God's called us, and we come together, and there's this joyous, refreshment of soul. It's like, this is, my, this is my brother. This is my sister. And God lifts our spirit and gives us, he gives to us life. Now, we can't manufacture this for anyone, but we want to offer this kind of refreshing, gospel-filled, joy-filled partnership. We want for believers to come here for believers to come here and not to feel beaten down as they leave, but to know all the more of our loving God. And when our worship and our proclamation surrounds the redeeming, loving, sustaining work of Jesus Christ, how can we help but to sense the refreshment of our soul? All week long we get beaten down with the concepts that we face and the difficulties that are around us. We come together and we're refreshed in remembering that there's a God who's for us, a God who's with us, a God who's in us that has redeemed us. For an hour and 20 minutes we come together and our minds are turned away from ourselves and toward our, toward our awesome God. And God provides refreshment 
in our soul. This passage also speaks of another benefit of the investing in the advancement of the gospel, and that's this. Christ will provide his blessing. Look at verse 29. It's very interesting, I think. Verse 29. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I will come with Christ's blessing along with me. Have you ever had someone ask you, will you, give the, will you offer the blessing for this food? Or if you heard of someone that has to, this young man that has to ask this young girl's father for his blessing to marry her. You heard of that? It's not foreign and that's not old. That's, that's, that's still a thing. It's like no one's marrying my daughter without asking for the blessing. All right? <laughs> yeah, you got it? Not happening. All right, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. He's got the greatest smile. <laughs> when we talk about going with the gospel, remember this. When we go with the gospel, the blessing of our Savior comes with us. Remember when the disciples were going out and he says, when you go into this house and they reject you, Wipe off your sandals. Walk away. Don't let your peace remain upon the house. Christ's blessing goes with the proclamation and reception of the gospel. And here Paul is talking about, I'm going to come, and I'm going to come, and Christ's coming with me. He's in this. He's on board. He's part of this mission. His last concept that we want to look at, and it's similar, it's very much related, is one final benefit associated with investing in the advance of the gospel, and that is God will provide his peace-giving presence. Look at verse 23. This is Paul's prayer, and he says, May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. As part of this mission, as part of uh, this investment in the, the gospel advance. May, God's, may the God of peace be with you. Now, think about this. He is a God of peace. This is who he is. He's the source of peace. He offers peace. He protects our hearts with peace in Philippians 4. If we'll let him, he'll rule our hearts with his peace in Colossians 3. And the result is that we have peace to offer to others. Not our peace, his peace. God attends with us. So I ask you a question as we conclude, are you at peace with God? He offers his peace. How does he offer it? Through Christ. He lived for you. He died for you. And he was raised for your justification, for your salvation. All of these things he's done for you to make you at peace with God. He offers you peace. He's given his son. He shed his blood. How do you receive that peace eternally? So very complicated. Call. Call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. It's pretty simple, isn't it? He's done everything. He's done everything. Whosoever shall call will be saved. This is the mission to which you and I have been called, to proclaim the salvation offered by God through Jesus Christ. We proclaim a God who loves and provide, not a God who is needy of anything. Let's pray together. Father, you know what we need. You know what every believer in this room needs. And you know what every unbeliever in this room needs. I pray that our time of worship 
through song, through prayer, through the consideration of your word would have provided just, just what is needed, refreshment of soul, and a call, a call to invest ourselves in your good work that is never stopped, your good work that will be fulfilled. Continue to encourage and enrich us by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.